Okay. So let's uh, start immediately. Uh, is it registering? Yes, okay. So welcome to our presentation with the students. We have already discussed this morning over tourism and under tourism and the example of Machu Picchu I just have uh, left out <laughs> because we will now hear from a much more competent person what's about uh, sustainable tourism now. We have heard from a state three years ago, I think, mm -hmm. and also together with you, he was visiting us. We heard about the, all the measures on Machu Picchu mm -hmm. and uh, to, to restore, to maintain much better this archaeological site. This archaeological site has been inscribed in 1983 mm -hmm. and uh, it's based on four criteria mm -hmm. uh, for UNESCO. And uh, it's above 2,400 meters altitude, but uh, it's just the top of the whole area. And as I understand, the challenge is not only to maintain the archaeological park now, but to have a sustainable tourism development, which is including all the valleys, all the transportation um, corridors and all the people arriving uh, and uh, using the infrastructure in uh, around the historic sanctuary. And here I'm very glad to have with us our um, Jose... Uh, excuse me, just... Jose Miguel Bastante. Jose Bastante, uh, he is the successor of uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bastete. And uh, you have studied cultural heritage management and have uh, also made in this field a PhD uh, in Peru. Then you have been working mainly uh, on Machu Picchu de to develop the new concepts. And uh, you have then presented this book, which you will show us now, what is the content. And as much as I have understood, you are working on this sustainable tourism model for the Machu Picchu. And I'm glad to have here also Adin Gavazzi. Gavazzi, uh, who is Gavazzi? Gavazzi. Um, who is a researcher in this field mainly. Mm -hmm. She's from the UNESCO chair in Genova. Yes. And she is involved in almost all the projects now conducted in Peru. But uh, you have uh, worked in different places, also in Asia, on different fields of cultural heritage, architectonical heritage, landscape mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. and so on. So you have a very uh, broad field of involvement in UNESCO World Heritage Activities. So I would like to give you now the opportunity to present us very brief the related and uh, then afterwards we will be eager to see what's about your new topic, about your uh, uh, booklet which you just have uh, published together with your Precisely the outstate, very understated. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. So, on behalf of the UNESCO Chair of Genova, it's a special day for us, a special event again joining together two UNESCO chairs, uh, one of this university, UZI, and one of Genova. We are specialized in anthropology of health, but we work mainly in world heritage sites. Uh, we are interested in everything which heals, everything which be, brings health, and Machu Picchu is one of those sites. And back in 1986, I started going to Machu Picchu as one of you with a backpack, and then I came back and came back and came back, and I slowly but surely built on a little bit of research until I met with archaeologists. Jose Basante, who was the very young and bright director of the Center of Investigation and Research of Machu Picchu. Because Machu Picchu is not just a World Heritage Site, it is also a center for investigation and also capacity building of young professionals in the theme of World Heritage Sites. 
So we had the opportunity to work a little bit together uh, until I was asked by uh, um, the predecessor of Jose, Fernando Sete, uh, to start a more structured project to identify a better narrative, to, to communicate Machu Picchu in a more contemporary and more scientific way apart from my specific investigation. And this is how uh, the collaboration with the Ministry of Culture came about, and most of all, the collaboration with Uzi. We came uh, uh, before the pandemic with, with Fernando, who presented Machu Picchu, and then the pandemic was a big suspension, and in the meantime, Jose became uh, the new director. And so he is back here uh, to tell us more about his specific work as an archaeologist and also as a professional photographer on what does it mean to understand a World Heritage Site, take care of it, and communicate it to the broader public. And also because of this, there is a very joint special project we share with uh, uh, UNESCO Lugano, which is the photographic archive of Fernando Stete, which has invaluable information, uh, which Jose really helped us to break through and understand. And together with Fernando Stete and Jose Bastante and professional photographer Heinz Blenge, we're building together a better narrative that works for the 21st century, a narrative which contains all the most important parts of the World Heritage Site values, the universal values, and at the same time entails scientific knowledge. But it's truly a pleasure and for me a professional personal achievement to present to you Jose Bastante and his truly excellent work in Machu Picchu. Thank you very much, Jose, for your words. Thank you for Professor's words and for Adin's words. Um, Okay, I understand we don't have too much time, so we're going to go with the presentation. Uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, obviously Machu Picchu. So this is the nuclear area of Machu Picchu, what you see in every picture. Uh, but Machu Picchu is a little bit more than that. The nuclear area is composed by the zone one and zone two, and it's basically 10 acres, uh, hectares, I'm sorry. Uh, Machu Picchu is more than 700 hectares, includes the Huayna Picchu Mountain, it is the classical one that you see on the picture, the Machu Picchu Mountain that is on the back, the uh, Oriental Terraces, the Museum Zone, so yeah, more than 700 hectares. We cannot talk about the Machu Picchu if we don't mention Hiram Bingham. A guy, a person that reinvented himself many times, explorer, when he rediscovered scientifically Machu Picchu to the rest of the world, and finally senator of the United States for two periods. Uh, his expeditions, 1911, 1912, and 1914-15, were very successful. Uh, the first maps of the area, uh, they really did a lot of things. We can uh, diminish the work of Bingham and it's the start of actually understanding Machu Picchu. Uh, in 2010 the Peruvian government um, signed an ag agreement memorandum between with the University of Yale. So the artifacts that Bingham dug in Machu Picchu will come back to Peru. They just forgot the artifacts that Bingham dug in some other sites. They forgot the artifacts that Bingham bought from Cusqueño collectors, they forgot about the more than 12,000 photographs that are documents, like really important documents that can show us how the things, not only Machu Picchu, but all around the country were back then. Um, so we are working on that. Uh, also the issue, the April 1913 issue of the National Geographic, was very successful. It's the issue that has sold like completely. From this point, National Geographic sales go up. And also the Eastman Kodak company, uh, everybody wants to take pictures like Bingham, pictures that are portrayed in this magazine. 
1983, like Professor mentioned, the historic sanctuary of Machu Picchu, or National Archaeological Park of Machu Picchu was inscribed in the World Heritage List. Like I told you before, Machu Picchu is not just a nuclear area, it's a bigger area, and the historic sanctuary, or National Archaeological Park, it's this thing that we see in green, more than 37,000 hectares. That's what it's inscribed in the World Heritage List. Like, this is the center of, of a huge territory, the Incas looking towards the Amazon. Because a lot of different reasons. Inside this territory, we have more than 60 archaeological monuments. We have more than 300 kilometers of roads, bridges, just in the area of the Machu Picchu Yacta. Yacta is a way the, the proper way in Quechua language to refer to a Andean city. The, the characteristics of an Andean city are completely different than the characteristics of a city in the in Occident, in the old world. So just in this area, we have five evidences, bridges that are connecting Machu Picchu with the other sites, like a spider web. Uh, here you have an example, there's, till now we have identified nine, even ten roads that connect Machu Picchu with other emplazamientos of the area. So this was firstly about the book, so we just published this two first volumes of uh, Machu Picchu Interdisciplinary Research that contain a lot of, well, 39 articles. Some of them have been published before. Some of them are product of the research program that has been taking place since 2013. And there's a lot of new information. The whole two volumes were still, the pandemic came, so we couldn't publish number three and four, but we will do it soon. Uh, in a way of democratizing information, like information should be available for everybody. These are, will just be some examples. Uh, these are lithic elements that have a, a channel carb that nobody knew what they were for. Uh, eventually, we measured them. We have them here in orange. And we realized that they fit exactly on the part of the water channel that it's inside the urban area of Machu Picchu. So why will the Incas will want to change this? Basically because this part of the channel is on top of the most important complex of the Yacta of Machu Picchu, that is the Temple of the Sun complex. And they needed to avoid any kind of infiltration of water that could affect these structures. So they were replaced, they were going to replace, they were working on this as a future modification of this small elements with a lot of unions for bigger elements that have less unions and will avoid, avoid, like I mentioned, any kind of infiltration. Another example will be this. In the middle of the plaza of Machu Picchu Yacta, there is a stone. In some pictures, we can see, you can find on the internet, we can see this stone is standing up. We did our research and we figure out that this guy, Olojo Cavada, that passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he worked during the 50s and the 60s in Machu Picchu. In 1958, he finds this lithic element and puts it in, it in a vertical position that he thought it was the originary position of this stone. Sadly, we didn't have pictures that can tell us if this is a carved stone or if it was really standing up. Also, the um, weathering has deteriorated the stone a lot, so we cannot really see the marks. This is what we have now. There has been some excavations in the 60s, in the 90s, but they were very limited. So we were a little bit more ambitious, so we excavated the whole, like 60 square meters around the rock. And we realized that there was some kind of agglomeration of stones 
and eventually we found the corner of a wall. So this is a wall surrounding this element. And if we go a little bit deeper and we check what the chronicles since the 16th century are writing about what was in the main square, in the center of the main square of Cusco, the Hatun Yakta, the great Yakta of Cusco, they're talking about, everybody basically agrees on this, a stone in the shape of a sugar love, of a prisma, surrounded by a crude wall. And that's exactly what we have in Machu Picchu. It's a crude wall surrounding this center. That is no surprise, like civilizations will replicate the their capital cities all around. That's part of it. Uh, anyway, uh, but we were still not sure about if this rock was really shaping the like a prisma, like the chronicles mentioned. Finally, a couple of years ago, like uh, we made an agreement with with the museum, with the Sling, Sling Museum of Czech Republic, and they sent us some pictures from uh, Czech travelers from 1959. So that's a year after our friend engineer Olojo Cavada put the stone standing up, and this is what we see. It's exactly the description. It's a stone that has been carved in a prisma shape. And here we cannot see the wall because it's buried, but it's a replica. Machu Picchu is a replica of Cusco City in a smaller and adapted to the geographical characteristics. Uh, cartography, yes, we have in the book all the maps since the first, very first one that depicts the area where Machu Picchu is located. This one that is much more precise is German uh, Hermann Göring, uh, an engineer working for the Peruvian government, making a road that will connect basically Ollantaytambo with Quillabamba. And he's using, in some parts, obviously, the previous Inca road. And now what we have there is the train tracks that take you to Machu Picchu. At the same time, more or less at the same time, the previous map was 1874. This is 1881. Uh, this is another German. He's not an engineer. He's not working for the Peruvian government. He's an entrepreneur that buys with some friends this huge territory. Uh, the ex Hacienda San Antonio de Torontoy and El Cercado. Somil here, you see the cursor, yes? Okay, Somil is where Aguascalientes town is located today. Aguascalientes is a town where tourists arrive before going to the actual nuclear era. Of the picture. Um, he, his first company is to make a uh, lum it was a lumber company to produce timber for the train track that was going from Cusco to the south. That didn't work very well. His second company was a mining company, so these yellow dots and red dots, silver, copper, ore, and gold. Burns was saying that his, the whole property was full with gold and silver, and you can just be walking next to the river and picking up the gold. He even went to U.S. He spent like two years there trying to get investors, but he was asking for like three hundred million dollars at the time. So, like nobody really bought that there was gold in granite. And his third company was to loot archaeological Inca sites. And the president at the time, the president of Peru, actually granted him the permission. Ten percent of the gold and silver that he will recover from this looting, he had to give it to the government and uh, the rest he, he could keep. We don't have too much information about this. Uh, we're still working on that. Recently, recently I mean like a couple of years ago, the, the Library of the Congress of the United States sent to Peru some documents related to Burns. It was very hard for us to get them, even though we're 
governmental institutions, there was some kind of hidden information. Uh, we're going to get into that. What is, as you can see, Burns map is not as precise as Gering's, Gering's, map, Gering's map. They were probably, they knew each other, definitely. They were working in the same area at the same time. What is really true about Burns is this. It says the flying steps leading from Kutukusi, that is a mountain next to Machu Picchu, to the towns of the metal workers of the Indians. So going to this top part, we have made explorations in all around this area, and basically there is no archaeological evidence there. Another interesting thing is that he puts Point Huaca del Inca. Huaca is a shrine. Huaca is how we refer to any archaeological site. It's a catch word also. He puts it on his side of the property, on his side of the river, I mean. So everything is on his side of the river. And this road that I was telling you, this is Machu Picchu. The road is here. It's called the Mando Wall. It's not a, it's not a wall. It's a road that is oriented to the Yananting Mountain. Re remember that mountains are important. Mountains in the Andean Cosmovision is their guts. They have influence in our daily social life. This is how it looks there. It's an elevated road. And in one of these papers, okay, here you can see these are the oriental terraces. This is the bus road that takes tourists to Machu Picchu, to the nuclear area. And eventually in one of these letters from Burns, we found this information. So he's basically describing one day he was walking around, he stumbled with this lost city of the, of the Incas. We're talking about 1870s. And even though this Burns map came out a few years ago, there was a lot of scholars that were questioning the presence of Burns in Machu Picchu. I mean, we have the evidence. He made a company to loot archaeological sites. He was living in front of Machu Picchu. It was more than obvious that he probably got to Machu Picchu. But some people actually need graffitis or something or, or a signature that says, I was here. Uh, we don't have that, but we found this. And he's talking about the, about this old city where the Inca workers of gold and silver used to live. The constructions are, full, uh, are complete, but all their entrances have been sealed. The road to this city has, uh, has these uh, steps carved on the rock at the base of the mountain. So this is what we have there. Um, at, the, at the foot of this same mountain where, where this city is located, we have a lot of great fountains that are still working. We have eight Inca fountains on this road. And finally, this is not Machu Picchu Yacta, it's Chachabamba, another, another side that like seven kilometers away from Machu Picchu, but inside the sanctuary. And we can see this is a picture of the expedition of Port Fechos in 1941. The, all the entrances and windows have been sealed. So this is what Burns is describing. So now we can place Burns in Machu Picchu in 1870s, uh, a few decades before Bingham. It, for it to be very clear, Machu Picchu was never lost, so it was never discovered. Machu Picchu was known to the people that live in the surroundings. Machu Picchu was visited mainly by people that were looking for those things that keep you from sleeping at night, finding gold in archaeological sites. Now, we have a couple of astronomical observatories in Machu Picchu that have been proven. This is a work of Professor Fernando Astete, Professor Shukowski, and Professor Kosciuk uh, since 2012. Uh, one inside the nuclear area of Machu Picchu and the other one on the west, let's say, face of the Huayna Picchu mountain. This is the one inside Machu Picchu in the cave of Intimachai. 
is precise, completely precise for uh, solstice observations, equinoxes, and probably, but we have to wait till 2023, if I'm not mistaken, for the May for the major lunistice. The computer programs say that this works. We have to check it on the field. We have done it for these three cases. And the Mirador of Incaracay is super interesting because there is a description of a structure exactly like this by the chroniclers for Cusco City. It has disappeared from Cusco, it has disappeared from the rest of the Tahuantinsuyo or Inca Empire, but, but we have it in Machu Picchu. And it's these holes that we have on this very fine wall that during the solstice, well, one of the holes is related to the sunrise in the uh, June solstice, and the other hole is related to the rise of the heliacal rise of the Pleiades stars uh, that is still valid when in, in the Andes, if you see them blur you're not going to have a very good year with rains and, and, and your crops are not going to be good. But if they're super clear, and that has a scientific explanation actually, uh, everything will be fine. Uh, drone photogrammetry with Professor Luis Jaime Castillo. We only had one radio car, well, a few radio car was this from, from one excavation from 1983. This was published in 87. But recently we published in 2020 the new radio carbon dating that gives us the idea of a Machu Picchu a little bit younger than we have always managed. Uh, basically, we're using the chronology of John Brown that says 1438. This Inca king, Pachacutec, defeats the Chancas and the expansion outside of Cusco starts. In less than a hundred years, the Incas conquer this huge territory, including Ecuador, parts of Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. But this was really not, not, not humanly possible. So the new radiocarbon dates that we're getting, the researchers are getting in Argentina, in Chile, in Ecuador, are telling us that the Incas were in these areas way before. And this radiocarbon dates from Machu Picchu and two other sites of the historic sanctuary confirmed this. So Machu Picchu was being built around 1420, uh, Choque Suizui 1380, Chachabamba 1400s. So a few decades, the Lincoln expansion started a few decades before. And this is important because we need to understand not to just use the ethno-historical evidence to construct a chronology. Chronology has to be constructed on hard data. And hard data, especially now with all the technology and AMS uh, carbon datings, it's, it's very advanced and we can rely on it. Technomorphology, this is the work of uh, Dr. Adin Gavazzi with the team of, of, of architects of Machu Picchu. Uh, now, with the agreement that we have with the chair of Genova, uh, Dr. Gavazzi is going to complete the technomorphology of the whole monument, of the whole nuclear area of Machu Picchu. And this is very important. She knows Machu Picchu because every little stone of every wall has been drawn by hand. And on top of that is the uh, laser scanning and some other technical equipment that she's using. We have established that there is metal working in Machu Picchu, definitely, but uh, it's just something for local use. This is the only gold object found in Machu Picchu, 1995 by Elba Torres. Uh, probably was not made in Machu Picchu. All the things that were made there are very, very basic, like show pins, some access, uh, some clubs, uh, tweezers, things for daily use. And we, we, just, we were just missing the, the melting pot 
for uh, for working with with metals, and we just founded a couple of years ago the first one. Well, probably there was other ones before, but we didn't realize. So now we can we have complete the working chain for producing metals in Machu Picchu. Pictures, like I mentioned, are very important, are, are historical documents. Here we can identify the people. Tomás Fuente, Richarte, and Álvarez are the three peasants that are living in Machu Picchu when Binga arrives. Eton, in charge of digging the funerary caves around the nuclear area of Machu Picchu, and somebody from the RMS, in this case Jiménez, that always accompany the expeditions with the palynological analysis that we have been made, making since the 90s, but with more uh, with more samples uh, since 2013, we can establish that there's a lot of products that are being harvested in Machu Picchu, but primarily, primarily in the agricultural zone that, of, of the nuclear area, it's corn. But, yeah, previous studies have established that if we plant everything in the nuclear zone, in, in the agricultural zone, we cannot feed, feed more than 58 people per year. This was uh, analyzed by Professor Wright and Professor Valencia. So what means if we plant all this with corn, this corn is not going to to be used as, as food. It's going to be used as offerings as a mean to converting it into chicha, that is corn beer, that is something that is needed in every ceremony in the Inca world. And when it's, okay, the amount of effort to build the services just to produce food for 58 people doesn't compensate the, the effort. No, so we need, there's, there should be another answer. And it's, even though archaeologists love to say that everything is ceremonial, in this case, yes, the production in the Andenes of Machu Picchu is ceremonial. But, and besides all these other crops that they're harvested here, there's products coming from everywhere, every different archaeological region. This is an experiment that we did in another monument inside the historic sanctuary, it's Choque Sui Sui, uh, with we recreated the traditional chakitakias, that is the uh, modern arado. ¿Cómo se dice arado? Instead of, the bull, of having the bulls with the... We just have... We didn't have big animals. The biggest animal is the llama, and the llama will not be able to pull anything. And if you put more than 30 kilos on a, on a llama, the llama will sit. It's a camel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a work that we're doing. We, we, we have the cooperation of a lot of people and institutions in Machu Picchu. It's, it's, it's really interdisciplinary research. This is uh, teledetection with geo radars uh, made by Professor Massini. Uh, this is LIDAR that has been done in Machu Picchu. This was done in 2015. Um, here, for example, uh, this was made Professor Fletcher from the University of Sydney. He is the, the assessor of this project. Uh, for example, this is the Huayna Picchu, I'm sorry, the, yes, the Huayna Picchu mountain, the Putupusi mountain. This is the modern town, Aguascalientes, or Machu Picchu town, as uh, it's called today. And here we can see that the river is making a, a, a 90 degrees turn, and that doesn't work in nature. So in the leader, we can see that the river was originally going through here, but the Incas, when they channelized the river, they made this 90 degrees turn. Excavations, oh, 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 what I'm showing you here is on the book, uh, the excavations that have been made with the color code after Bingham. And these ones are the ones that Bingham made. We reconstructed this excavation. There was never a map from the Bingham Expeditions, we reconstructed it based on the camp diaries of him and his assistants. So if you know the, the place, you can actually go with the camp diary and say, 
next to the rock that has this shape like 20 meters to the south that's what where we put this excavation two by two and yeah more or less uh, this this is kind of correct uh, well the, the this was the the first map of, of the area in <laughs> from Orikain and the old documents there, there, there has been a, a huge misconception about Machu Picchu because people still think and this is something that was proposed by John Rowe from the North American school the Machu Picchu was a palace a country house for Pachacutec and based on the documents we can tell that it was not that and based on the evidence and all the other archaeological finds that we have uh, made uh, Machu Picchu is an administrative, religious, and political center that is the head of this huge area that compromises the uh, Vilcabamba region that is uh, towards the jungle. Uh, here, for example, is a document in 1568. They bring all these old people and they ask them who owns this land. Well, uh, it was the Augustinians that wanted these lands. They were asking the Spanish government, it's like, we're poor, we're a poor congregation, we need more lands. And the, the government decided to ask the people from the area or from somewhere near. And they all, basically, they all said, it be, these lands belong to Ingayupanqui, that is Pachacute. Uh, in the in the Andean world, the idea of me being the father leaving you a heritage in land or, or, or something doesn't work exactly like that. Private pro, private property it's it's a little bit questionable in the Andes before the Spaniards arrived. But the people there understood very fast how this Spanish mentality was. So if I claim that I'm the grandson of Pachacute and these lands belong to Pachacute, so they belong to me also. So that was why they answer in this way. And other documents, this one is 1579, are talking about that these lands where Machu Picchu is located are from the old Incas, from the old Incas, dedicated, from the old Incas means political part dedicated to the sun and the huacas and the shrines, means religious part. So this is a government-owned property. It's, it's, ayak. Here, yes. Here goes, uh, make sure, in 15 minutes we need, we need to finish, if you could also touch the touristic dimension. Yeah, we're going to go there now. Yeah, uh, left picture, old picture, uh, right picture is today picture. So with this, we're proving originality and authenticity of Machu Picchu. Everything remains more or less the same. There has been some restoration. Uh, we have a new vision for Machu Picchu. We need to change the, the way Machu Picchu has been managed for the last 40 years. There's a lot of work, especially in conservation and in research. And we have more than 250 people in, within the borders of the National Archaeological Park or Historic Sanctuary working on this. Uh, measurements for management for visitors include using these uh, parrillas drenantes to avoid soil erosion, covering some structures with wood so we will avoid any kind of negative impacts on the stone surfaces. Uh, we have been replacing these synthetic ropes that delimitate the roads where people can actually walk with cabuya, and cabuya is the same element that the Incas used to tie their roofs. That's the signals in Machu Picchu are very simple because we usually suggest that people will go with a guide, uh, more accessible to people with limited capacities. In 2016, we inaugurated the exit ramp, so people do not have to enter and exit through the same way they can exit uh, it's 
the tourism flow is much more adequate. We have been protecting some structures, but we had to give other options. So we have been opening other roads through areas that are actually have hardly an impact on the universal exceptional value of Machu Picchu, of the Yaka, especially the, the what the universal value is, is, is based on the physical characteristics of the site. We have been closing some spaces that can generate some kind of uh, conservation problems or danger for tourism. We have been changing what we there was before because Machu Picchu needs to be presented as uh, the, as the importance that it has that showing the information to everybody is very, very important. Uh, this is another measure that started in January in 2019. Uh, people were desperate, especially Europeans, to visit Machu Picchu when we opened, six o'clock in the morning, because the idea was that the sun will come out and will illuminate the city. Doesn't exactly happen like that, and we are in an area that there's, where there's a lot of mist during the first hours of the day. So sun will come 7, 7.20, if it comes, sometimes no. We needed to distribute this load capacity through different times of the day. So for you to get an example, we set the, the hours that you can enter. And in 2018, 28,000 before 7 a.m. In 2019, only 16,000, well, 17,000. So where's the rest of the people that were distributed in the next hour? So if I have a ticket that says 10 a.m., I can enter Machu Picchu between 10 and 11. If I am before, I'm not going to be able to enter or after. The three areas that are very delicate in Machu Picchu, on those we put timelines also. So the Intihuatana Pyramid from 7 to 10, open. Temple of the Condor from 10 to 1, and Temple of the Sun from 1 to 4. If you're walking during your normal circuit and you arrive at this time, you will be able to, en to enter. If not, you will just have to continue the circuit. These uh, numbers, what would, has happened with Machu Picchu, 2006, 2006, 2019, this means an average of 4,100 4, visitors per day. Uh, 2020 with the pandemic, 2021 we are recovering, but we're never where we will get to this number back again. But we need some conditions. Now, uh, with in 2020 we established the capacity of Machu Picchu in 2,244 visitors per day as a maximum distributed in hours, and this is based on the study of capacity and limits of acceptable change. UNESCO finally, after a few years asking us for this, they have, they're pretty happy. They have uh, uh, salute the Peruvian government for establishing this number. But last year we were having a little bit of pressure. So we had to raise the number. But the number has been raised, not affecting the nuclear area of Machu Picchu. It has been raised by opening the alternate routes, Huayna Picchu Mountain, Huchu Picchu Mountain, and Machu Picchu Mountain. So uh, we are still with the recommendations. We are still complying with the recommendations of UNESCO. And with this raise of capacity that we did, um, it comes with some extra things. So it comes with basically oh, the number, well, letter A is opening the space and more diversification of routes and B is the whole monitoring system. We need that. We need to like foresee any kind of negative impact that could come and avoid it as soon as possible. So everybody has agreed with this, all the ministers, tourism, culture, the regional government, etc., etc. So we can grow, yes, but in order. 
And in order to grow in order, we need uh, some tools. These are the new circuits that are around Machu Picchu. All this information is available on our webpage, machupicchu.gov.gov.p. So with the actual management system, we cannot grow. And it goes against sustainability. Uh, what we're trying to, to do is conservate adequately the whole area, not just the yakta, minimize the negative effects of tourism, because there is negative effects, allow uh, a grow of, of tourism, but on, on a pretty order way, and generate better quality of life for the people that live in the area and the workers, of course, that give their lives to maintaining our heritage. And everything is resumed in this that you well known uh, so sustainable tourism, uh, quality, continuity, and equity. And we need to change the management model that we have been doing since a few years ago. Now there's a probably there's probably going to be a new airport in Cusco that will receive a lot of people. Where are they going to go? Machu Picchu has a limited capacity. We need the visitor center that will regulate this flux of tourism and will allow us to receive up to 6,000 visitors a day. Machu Picchu town, the nuclear area of Machu Picchu, the visitor center will be located here where the museum is actually nowadays. We are bringing Machu Picchu closer to the town. Today, if you're asking the town, how long do I take to Machu Picchu? They will say in a bus, 30 minutes, if you're walking an hour and 20. When the visitor center is here, when you cross the river, it will be on a bus five minutes and walking 20 minutes. So the minute you cross the bridge, your experience in Machu Picchu already started because since I, like I mentioned in the beginning, Machu Picchu is all this. All the evidences go all the way to the lower body next to the river. That, those are renders of the visitor center. And this is basically what's going to happen. I enter, control my ticket, visitor center. I go into an immersion area, 10 minutes, where you will learn that Machu Picchu is a sacred place. It's not uh, a park. It's an archaeological park, but not a normal park. You need to behave like you should behave in any uh, religious side of any religion. If you go to a church, you know that you cannot jump on the bench or start touching the Jesus that is on, on, on next to the altar. It's exactly the same. You don't, you don't need to get taught this, but that's why we need to inform people. Information is very important. That and the rules for visiting the site, because there are many, actually. If we want to keep Machu Picchu, we want Machu Picchu for 10 years or for 100 years. After that, that is 10 minutes, you, you can option to see the new museum, uh, walk around the river area, mm -hmm. the botanical garden, the medicinal plant garden, that is something we're working with the Chair of Genova and Dr. Gavazzi and Dr. Tania Re. And, and then option if you walk through the Burns Road to Machu Picchu, to the nuclear area, through the Bingham Road, the same road that Bingham took, that is actually the one that visitors more or less take today, or I just jump on the bus again and go to the nuclear area of Machu Picchu. We compensate the permanent friction there with a more conceptual experience on the side. This will give uh, better needs, a uh, better economy also for the town because people will want to spend a the night there. It will be impossible to do all this if you don't if you don't spend a night there. And like we will promote all the things that they have in Aguascalientes today, Machu Picchu town. UNESCO is super mega extra happy with the visitor center, and they basically say, "Hey, do it. This can be an example for the for other sites." Just for you to get an idea, this will be the visitor first visitor center, hopefully soon, in the next two years. The second visitor center through the Amazonian access, more enfocated into the Incas on the Amazon. 
And all these sites around Machu Picchu, there's, like I mentioned at the first, in the first moment, there is more than nine roads that arrive to Machu Picchu. We need to use them. Like not everybody at the same time at the nuclear area will allow us to get more visitors and will allow a better experience for them. It's not, conservation is first, but we also care about the visitor experience. This is what's going to happen, our projections. If we don't change the management model with pressure to go over the limits that we have all the time, uh, the sustainability of, of the destination and its values, they go very bad. The, the visitor flow, more or less, the level of satisfaction of the experience goes down and the effects on the economy, they're not uh, very good. If we are controlling the limits, things are well from the conservation side, but the economy, it goes completely wrong. And But we, if we apply the new management model, everything will go up and everybody will be happy. There's a lot of work actually. Uh, okay, so this is our web page of Machu Picchu where you can find all the information, the book, the first two uh, tomos of the book that you can download for free, the virtual visit to the site museum because not too many of you can get there. Machu Picchu by Fernando Stete are the pictures that Adin was mentioning. Uh, with the help of, of the chair of Genova, we, we have been able to to digitalize these pictures that like Fernando was the chief of the park for 22 years. I'm in Machu Picchu only 10 years now. Still have another 10 to go. Uh, these are the new folletos that can be downloaded also in English, in Spanish and in Quechua. The first picture of Machu Picchu taken by Bingen, 24 of July, 1911. And obviously, I mentioned already, 250 people that work in Machu Picchu. Much more the work in the direction of culture of Cusco and much more the work in the Ministry of Culture. Everybody puts its little granito de arena for uh, the conservation of our heritage. And this is just a picture to show that this is a teamwork. It's not a person, it's everybody involved and everybody that uh, actually has uh, a mission when maintaining our heritage for future generations and for our generation also. Thank you very much.